Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, Pierre Sebelin speaking and uh, I'm uh, really happy to start this uh, conference, uh, web conference on the standards development process. So I'm working uh, at the IEC central office in Geneva in the technical department. The purpose of this presentation is to go through the standards development process uh, and to uh, give some insight about the various steps and stages during that development. Okay, so let's uh, move forward on this. <clears throat> First of all, uh, the development of international standards is uh, following some basic governing principles that uh, have been established by the United Nations. One is uh, transparency. What we mean by transparency is that, in fact, uh, the, the management, the development and the decisions regarding the, develop, the standards development are made in a full transparent way. That we do not have standards projects that are initiated uh, and pop-ups like, uh, you know, without any justification. And that uh, all the decisions and the, and the votes are clearly uh, documented and clearly, I mean, uh, published uh, on the IC uh, website. So, in fact, uh, this is one uh, of the key elements in the IEC when we develop standards. We want to really ensure full transparency on uh, the way we work and the way we develop standards and the processes that we use for that. Another one is openness. So, openness is uh, basically we need to include uh, all the stakeholders that uh, feel being concerned by a given standard. So they should all have the opportunity and the possibility to be part of the development of these standards. Another governing principle is impartiality and consensus. So at least we have the way we manage uh, the standards development. Uh, we have to do this in a neutral way. And we have to develop consensus between the stakeholders in order to agree on the content of the standards. Efficiency and relevance. Efficiency because we have to use development methods for our standards that are efficient and at that point we use the, I would say, project management approach for this. And the relevance in a way that uh, the standards that we develop have need to have uh, a market need and the coherence. So the set of standards we have should be coherent one between the others. And finally, uh, there is the request also from the United Nations to address the concerns of the developing countries. All these governing principles uh, are documented in the United Nations in, uh, I mean, the documents governing the uh, uh, the World Trade Organization and mainly the elimination of the technical barriers to trade. So you have here a reference uh, to the full document explaining this if you're interested. Okay, so I see that there's already uh, one question which is do you know if ISO follows the same principle of transparency so effectively uh, the ISO has the exact, exact uh, same <clears throat> uh, governing principles to follow as they are also uh, an organization recognized by the United Nations like the IEC. So let's move forward and have first, uh, I would say, a really uh, global and summarized uh, vision of the international standards workflow. So, the objective of the process is to publish documents like standards, like technical reports and so on. On one side, we have technical committees. 
So we have committee one, two, today committee 124. Each technical committee is in fact a group of experts and it's an entity where they do the development for a specific technology field. So we have a technical committee on wind turbines, on uh, medical equipment, on building installations, on overhead lines and so on and so forth. So we have more than a hundred of these committees. On the other side we have countries and so in each country we have a national committee which would be like from the industry standpoint which would be like a subsidiary and in each country we have stakeholders that are industry, users, acad academia, government and so on. So each country has a, stake, a set of stakeholders and a national committee. At that point we have 83 uh, national committees um, in the IEC plus um, 87 uh, committees in the developing economies. From there, in each country, uh, the stakeholders like industry, users or academias, they send requirements to the national committee stating that they would need a standard on such a subject or such another subject. The national committee analyzes the need and de determines, identifies the proper technical committee. So if the standards needed is about the wearables, for example, so wearable devices, then they would direct the request to the last technical committee we established, which is the 124. So the national committees then create work items based on these requests and they send the work items to the adequate technical committee. So they would send several work items to several technical committees depending on what they receive. From there, we then we have the national stakeholders that provide expert resources. So the industry uses an academia for, from each country. They can send experts into the technical committees and these experts, they would be in the working group that will develop the standards. They will really write the standards. Once they have written a draft and that they think the draft is mature enough uh, to be commented by the national committees, then they would send back these drafts to the national committees. So then we have a set of exchange of information between the group in the technical committee developing the standards and the national committee reviewing the standard and voting on it. So we have an exchange with several phases where we have comments and votes coming and drafts coming back and forth. And once the final draft is voted and approved, then the standard is ready to be published. So in order to go more in details, uh, I propose you to first take uh, the example of the development process for a specific standard. So I propose you to take a standard that has been published uh, some time ago by the T Technical Committee 59, uh, which is taking care of the performance of household and similar electrical appliances. And the standard we will uh, review and, uh, uh, to, right now is the IC62849, which is about the performance and evaluation methods of mobile household robots. So this is these robots that go, you know, like on their own to do vacuum cleaners in the, in the houses. So first of all, the first step is to approve the start of a project. So in fact, to have the national committees voting and approve to start a new project, there is a ballot opened and this is called uh, the vote on the NP, NP for New Work Item Proposal. So this uh, New Work Item Proposal, which is a document containing the description of the standards to be developed, 
uh, is usually prepared by one of the key members of the committee and the secretary of this technical committee reviews this uh, document and then sends it to the central office, CEO means central office in Geneva. The central office circulates and opens the, the vote system and the P members, they vote and nominate experts. There are, uh, the criteria for uh, approving an NP is a two-third majority of positive votes and uh, the nomination of a minimum of five experts to work on the project. The ballot time for the NP is usually 12 weeks. It can be shortened to eight weeks uh, by decision of the committee and can also shorten down to four weeks only in the case that where we have a table of content attached to the NP and not a full draft of standards. Once the ballot on the NP is closed, then there is the need to send back to all the national committees the results of the votes that have been received by all the countries on that and also the comments. And this is done in the RVM document, which is the, the result of vote on NP. And there is a delay of four weeks after the ballot closing for the NP to send out that document. So let's have a look into an NP document. This is an NP document. So the NP document is made of, in fact, first of all, two pages of header and then the draft of the document. So let's go back through this header and see the information which is contained into that document. So we have the, in fact, okay, the proposal, the date, but the most important here is that we have the date for the circulation. This is when we sent out the document and opened the ballot for the vote. And this is the closing date for the ballot. So this is the, in fact, this is the date when this document is, is available on the IC website. And this is the closing date. Okay. Then we have a title for the proposal. So a title for the new uh, standards to be developed. Then we have the scope of the standard, which is explained what the standard will talk about. Then we have a purpose and justification which explains the market relevance for such a standard. Then we have a first draft or first, I mean, preview of the project plan when the first CD will be circulated and when it is planned to have that international standard published. This is just a rough view. And then there is an estimated number of meetings and so on. Then there is uh, other information. One important information here is, is there, is, this is to mention if there is a need of collaboration with another IEC or ISO technical committee. Then here it is specified if this is a draft, if a draft is attached or if an outline is attached here. And here there is the nomination of a project leader, which is made by the proposer. Then on the second page of uh, the header, we have some input from the TCSC officers. We have all well, the signature of the proposer and so on. And then there is an explanation here about the approval criteria and how to fill in the form. So this is some help text here uh, on how to fill in the form. From this, then, Attached as an annex to this uh, cover page, we have the first draft of the, the standard. And there it was told that it was said that it was a table of content. So we have here the table of content of the proposed standard. And there is also a short forward to justify the market relevance. And then there is here the scope, some normative references, and then we can see already a beginning of a few things about the standards, okay, where we have mainly some text, but we have also, you know, just some uh, headers for clauses of the future standards. No text is being yet completely written in that standard. So this is a real rough draft, and this is, this is a, 
you know, the document, the document is only a few pages. So this is the document and the information which is received by the National Committee to vote on the fact that they would or not approve to initiate a project on that standard. From there, once the ballot is closed, we have the RVN document. Let's have a look on it. So once the ballot is closed, this document is sent out to all the people in the technical committee and also the national committees that are uh, team members into the, com the technical committee. So there we have the RVN. So we have, well, the reference number, but we have mainly here the results for the vote here. So here we have the results for the vote with the number of people that be member voting, the ones that are approving, the ones having nominated experts and approved, and then the total number of P members. And from there, we have the vote results that the proposal is supported by a simple majority and it is at least four P members have, uh, or five, four P members in the case of committees with 16 fewer P members, or at least five P members have approved, have provided experts. So we have this, and then we have the conclusion that the proposal is approved and the work item has been introduced in the work program under the following title. And there we have a number. So a number is assigned to that standard, and we have a title. Then we have the project leader here. Then here we have a, propose, a proposal for uh, project plan, so the deadlines for the project. So this is filled in by the project leader who is proposing some deadlines like when the first CD is expected to be circulated, the CDV, FTIS, and the expected publication date for that, pro, uh, for that standard. Okay, and then on the other page here we have uh, where, uh, we have the list of experts that have been nominated by uh, the national committees. Following that cover page, we have then a table which summarizes the vote results, and we can see each country uh, uh, which is either P or O member in the committee and what they voted in full transparency. Then we have the experts again, and then here we have the comments that have been made by the uh, national committees that voted on the standard. So like, for example, we have the German National Committee supports this MP in principle, however, the submitted text needs refinements in many points. We suggest to start a new working group in TC59 or a new subcommittee, for example, this was a proposal. Okay, so we have comments like this, uh, several comments from the, you know, Sweden, Sweden, Korea, Germany, France, UK, Japan, and so on. Okay, so this was the RVN. From this point, uh, the, I mean, the project has been approved, and so the group of experts and the working group can start to develop the draft of the standard based on that initial document that has been attached to the NP. So these people, they would uh, meet, they would have online meetings, and they would work on the draft and write uh, a more elaborated document. And once they feel that the document is uh, good enough to be uh, discussed by the, the P members of the technical committee, then the, uh, the experts would then uh, send out what we call a committee draft for commenting by the uh, national committees. So then at that stage, the project leader provides the draft to the secretary. The secretary reviews and forwards to the central office the central office circulates and open the voting system, and the P members of the committee provide comments. The commenting period can be 8, 12, or 16 weeks upon decision of the uh, secretary. And once 
the comments the ballot is closed there is uh, four weeks uh, to uh, send out the compilation of comments so let's have a look on what uh, on what is a CD and then the compilation of comment which is the CC so we start with the CD so the CD has a cover page which explains here that uh, the project number we have the uh, let's open this here we have the number of the standards here we have the technical committee concerned here we have the title for the standard here it says that it supersedes the NP and the RVN documents and then we have here title and an intruder and introductory note which, which says please note that uh, the two months commenting periods okay and from there on the second page after the cover page we have the draft standards we can see that in that document we have numbered all the lines in order to make the commenting more easy so you have the table of contents you have a forward you have an introduction, then you have here the scope, the normative reference. So you have something which is looking already like a draft standard and a good elaborated draft standard. Okay. So that has been sent to all the P members to be commented. From there, at the closing of the ballot, we receive the comments and this is the document that we send out in order to share all the comments received by all the P members with the other P members and with the uh, uh, experts in the technical committee and in the working group. So this is the compilation of comments. There is uh, the document number, there is the date for the circulation, and then here you, are, you have the reference to the standard we talk about. And here, this is, we have here the decision that has been made by the technical committee. And the technical committee has made a decision that a revised committee draft will be circulated as a committee draft for vote. So they have decided that following the uh, CD, they would go for a CDV. They would not need to make, a, for example, a second CD, but they found that the draft would, was mature enough to move forward to the next stage. And then following this, on the, for, uh, the next page, we have the list of all the uh, P members and O members and who provided comments and who did not, and the date and the statistics, the total number of comments. And then we have all the comments provided by uh, all the P members. So we can see that we have two comments from Germany, we have uh, 14, oh, a lot of comments from UK, 29 comments from UK, and so on, so then comments from Italy, from Mexico, here, okay. So here we see that on the first call here, this was Germany, Germany, and then the comments from UK are here, all the comments from UK. So then you have the line number the comments is dealing with, the close or subclose number, and the type of comments. Comments can be technical, can be editorial, and can be general. Okay, then you have the comment by itself, here, in that column, and every comment, for every comment, the National Committee is requested to make a proposed change. So if in the comments they say we don't like this, then in the proposed change they have to say we would prefer to have this. And this is a requirement. If there is no proposal, then the working group may not consider the comments. And then here, in the observation from the Secretariat column, this is where the people, the group working on the standard, review the comment and, and propose its answers, whether they accept the comment or they reject the comment, with usually a justification why they reject the comment. So you can see that some comments are accepted and some others are rejected. 
Okay, so with that process of the compilation of comment, it is really possible to be fully transparent about who has commented what and, and if that comment has been accepted or not. And so now, following these comments and the resolution of the comments, which is uh, the fact of stating whether it's accepted or not, the comment. So once the comments are resolved, then the working group developing the standard has all the information they need to convert the CD into a new draft, which will be the CDD. So they will continue to work on the draft, implement and integrate uh, what they have accepted as comments, and also maybe further work on the document as well on their side. And once they have done all this work, then they can move to the next stage, which is the first time where at that stage where there is a vote requested on a document. And that stage is the commenting and vote on the CDV, Committee Draft for Vote. So then the working group prepares that CDV and then the project leaders send that CDV to the secretary that forwards it to the central office. At that time, we don't circulate that document for vote immediately. First of all, we translate that document and also we offer, I mean, we translate it into French, but we also offer time for all nations. We offer six weeks to translate into their national language. Okay, oh, I have, oof, I have one or two questions that came in. Uh, I don't know whether I should stop. Uh, okay, I'm trying, I'll stop and address the question. So, is it a requirement to justify rejected comments? So then we have to go back uh, here. No, so it is not a requirement to justify rejected comments. Um, this is just, I mean, uh, a question of politeness and transparency. Maybe it's a question of transparency to explain why you reject the comments. But this is not a formal requirement uh, written in our directives. Then, regarding the document numbering, it looks like the standard format is TC number, sequence number, and document type. This is effectively correct. So let's go back to the CDV. So um, there is the draft. So the draft is uh, is translated and can be translated also at the national level because many countries. Uh, have regulations that require the, the standards to be reviewed at the CDV level for public inquiry and then if there is a public inquiry then if it's in Italy the standards needs to be translated in Italian for example. Okay, then there is a vote once this is uh, done then the standard, the CDV is sent out for vote and commenting for a 12 weeks period. So the ballot is open and the CDV document is sent out. At the closing of the ballot, then the acceptance criteria is a two-third majority of the votes cast by the P members and we have also need to have no more than one quarter of negative votes. So once the ballot is closed, all the voting results and the comments, they have to be uh, shared together with the uh, key members and the experts in the TC by circulating the RV, the RVC, and there is a deadline of 12 weeks after closing of the CDV ballot, okay, to do this. If uh, no technical changes are needed, then it is possible to proceed directly to publication. If technical changes are needed, then we have to go for an additional stage, which is the FDIs that we look at just, late, just after this. But first, let's have a look on the CDV document. Look at the CDV document here. So that's the CDV document. Let's go back to the beginning. So here's the cover page. We always have the same information. We have here the circulation date, when the document was circulated. And we have here the closing date for the ballot. 
we have an additional field here that indicates whether the document is submitted to parallel vote at European level in CENELEC. There is here a field allowing to mention if the, doc, if the standard is to be considered as a horizontal standard or not. And there are also here an additional field uh, allowing to specify whether the standard is dealing with safety, EMC environment or quality insurance. From there, we have just the, the number and the title of the standard and then just a, a warning message. And right after that cover page, we have our draft standard. So this is, in fact, a second evolution of the draft following the CD. We still have the line numbers. And we can see here, well, if we would take time to look into the details into this, we would see whether all the comments have been implemented or not. But we can see here that the, the standard is a little longer and has a little more figures, so it is further worked. Okay? And from this, then we also have the RVC document. And so let's go back here. This is the header of the RVC document. We see here when the RVC has been circulated, the date, we have the reference numbers and so on. And there we can see that uh, the decision and the decision following the, uh, the CDV is that the CDV will be registered as an FDIS. FDIS is Final Draft International Standard by February 2016. So there is here an indication of which next stage has been selected by the committee for this project, this project and what is the target date for that next stage here. From there, then on the next page, we have the voting results summary. And we can see here in the vote column who voted abstain, for example, who approved and voted yes, like this here, we can say China voted yes, and who voted against the draft. So, for example, we can see here that Japan voted against the draft. And at the bottom here, we have a summary of the results. And we can see here that we had 18 P members voting. We had 17 in favor, which is 94.4%. As the approval criteria is 66.7, then the result is that it's approved. And we have a total of 24 votes casted one against, which is 4%, which is inferior to 25%. So the second approval criteria is also filled in. This is approved. And so the final decision is that the CDV is approved. So here we see the results. And then on the next page in the same document, we have again all the documents received, uh, all the comments made by the P members on the document, and we have, okay, here this is from Czechoslovakia, that these two first comments, then comments from Germany, and so on. And then we have the line number, the close, this is a technical comment, and comment is, we suggest determining relate, relative humidity and adding the following sentence, relative humidity, 50% plus minus 5%, here should be taken to avoid changes during a test, and this is rejected. The condition of relative humidity is well defined by this standard and more restrictive requirement is not necessary. So here, the Czech, they made another uh, proposal and that was accepted with modifications. Okay, and so we can see here that we have quite a few comments from many countries and that most of these comments, they have been accepted. I think we can maybe go back to the Japanese comment here. We can see that the Japanese, they are not happy with... Uh, uh, so this document covers so only, only so-called automatic battery operated cleaners, which is shown in Annex B. Title should, should, content the, uh, should show the content of the document. Then they don't agree with the scope, which is too, va too vague. The scope shall 
uh, show limits, etc. So we have some comments from Japan, quite a few, and some of them have been rejected, some of them have been accepted. So this, this is the comments that we have, and from there, as the decision was made to uh, go for uh, an FDIS, Final Draft International Standards, then the working group will take the CDV they have circulated, will take all the comments they received and whether they accepted or not these comments and will integrate the results of the acceptance of the comments into the CDV draft to generate the FDIS. And so then we go on the final vote and so the working group prepares the FDIS and then that FDIS is, sub is submitted to the national committees for vote only. So we vote on the FDIS which is the final draft international standard. The draft is prepared by the project leader and sent to central office uh, by the secretary. Then the voting period is six weeks. The acceptance criteria are the same. We need a two-third majority of the votes and we need no more than one quarter of negative votes. All negative votes shall be justified by a technical reason and the deadline to send out the result of the vote after the closing is two weeks after the closing there. Oh, I, had a, I have a question which is coming in and which says who have a say formally in, process, in processing the received documents to the CDV? Who finally decides? So, the responsibility of the content of the draft, I mean what is written in a CDV or what is written in, a, in an FDIS, the responsibility is to the secretary. So the secretary could, by his own initiative, change the content of the standard before sending it to the central office, that is his responsibility. But if he does so, he also has then to justify this to the working group. Okay. But the responsibility of the content of all the documents is to the secretary. So then let's go and have a look to the FDIS. So this is the FDIS form. So like any other form, we have the number, uh, we have the time uh, it is distributed and the day the ballot is open, the closing date for the ballot here, it's superseding the CDV and the RVC, we still have the Senelec uh, checkbox, the horizontal standards checkbox and the functions checkbox there and otherwise we have the title and there as the document has been translated we have then an English and a French title there and from that cover page then we see here afterwards the uh, FDIS as you can see here there's no more line numbers because um, <coughs> uh, the the national committees are not expected to comment, they are expected to vote on the document and say whether they would uh, uh, approve or not the standard. So the document that you see now as the, as the FDIS submitted for vote is exactly the same, is completely finished and edited. This is the same that we plan to publish afterwards. So this is a document that will not be further uh, edited, modified and so on. This is like it will be published and then the national committees, the P members would vote yes or no on that document. And so we see we have now the table of content which is even uh, more long, longer down and we have the forward and we have the introduction, the scope and then we have the standard now which is once more, a little more elaborated with more figures, more text, and annexes and so on, and the bibliography. So this is the document which we have to vote on, and this is the FDIS uh, form, and then once the ballot is closed, 
Then we send out the RVD, which is the result of vote on an FDIS. And there we can see here the result of the vote. And we can see here uh, that uh, in the vote column, we can see all the P members and the O members. Here you can see the status, either the country that are, oopla, that are P members in, in the committee here, or that are O member in the committee. So you can see which uh, country is P or O member. And then you can see here whether they have voted yes, abstain, or they cast a negative vote. And we see there's no negative vote. And we see that Japan, who did cast a negative vote on the CDV, changed to an abstain vote. And so now we can see here the summary of the voting results there. And we can see that we had uh, 22 members voting and that we, ha that we have uh, 22 members in favor and we have 100% of approval and so this is approved and then we have zero vote against so this is also approved so the final decision is that the standard is approved. And this is the contain of the RVD, these two pages. And so once the RVD uh, has been circulated, then we can just go to the next page, uh, next, which is the publication of the standard. And now we have been through the whole process. Okay, I'd like to show you now a few summary slides to remind about the key issues, about all the, the key stages in the process. So, in fact, in the standard development process, we have seven stages uh, for the, to go through the whole process. I didn't mention up to now, uh, didn't talk about the first stage, which is optional, which is the preliminary work item, which is, in fact, uh, the action of publicly recording in the program of work a preliminary work item which shows the intention of the committee to start the development of a standard in for a specific subject. So it's just a way to raise the flag and say, hey industry or hey stakeholders, uh, we are planning to work on a standard on that subject. This is the preliminary work item. After this, then we go back to the uh, process that uh, we've now seen. So we have the NP, which is the new work by the proposal, and the vote with the RVN, with the result of vote on the new project. Then we have the working group uh, draft, which is an internal document inside the, pro the working group developing the standard. Then, when they feel it is mature enough, they send a CD for comment to the national committees or the P members, okay? And once they receive the comments, there is a compilation of comment, a CC, which shows to everybody what comment have be, comments have been received. Then, once the, this is uh, done, then the project team works on the CDV, opens the ballot, and then on that CDV we have votes and comments and in the RVC we can see which uh, country voted what and also we have the compilation of all the comments together with the answers from the working group. Then we have the final draft international standard which is voted but no comments and then we have the RVD which is summarizing the votes on the FDIS and then we have the publication of the international standards. Okay, I have, two, I have two questions that came in, so let's just address the questions while we are in the context uh, of them. So one question is, what determines the status of a national committee as a PRO member? Okay, so in fact, P member means participating member and O member means observer member. Any national committee 
can request or ask to be P member or O member in any technical committee. When you request to become a P member, you make three basic requirements. The first one is to provide experts in the working groups of the technical committee. The second one is to vote and comment on all the documents. And the third one is to send delegates at the plenary meeting. So a national committee, let's say for example Spain, would, uh, would go or would accept and would request to become a P member for, let's say, for example, the wind turbines technical committee, if they have industries backing up that and industries that are willing and interested to engage in standardization and that are willing to send people to working group meetings, willing to uh, provide recommendations and comments, recommendations on votes and comments, and willing to send experts also and delegates at the plenary meetings. So in fact, uh, becoming a P member for a national committee requires some support uh, from uh, the national industry. Now, so this is an individual choice of each national committee to become a P or an O member in a committee, in a technical committee. And they just have to send uh, an email to the central office and say, we want to be P member in technical committee 22. And then we just change the status of Spain, for example, to become P member in 22. And then they can send another email saying, we don't want anymore to be P member. And we change the status back either to O member if they requested O member or to uh, no more membership. So this is a decision made at the national committee that we execute. Then I have another question, which is maybe a question for later oh, in the presentation. Can you explain the difference between IS and a TS? So an IS is an international standard and a TS is a technical specification. I may maybe effectively uh, address this question uh, after I'm done with my presentation. I still have a few slides to move forward. So let's go back to the presentation. So uh, at the IEC, we use a lot of abbreviations. And so this is, uh, we have to get used to this. And so here is a summary of all the abbreviations that have been uh, mentioned in, during uh, that presentation. And you can see here the NPR, the NCD, what they mean. Then also in the case where a major draft is available. So for example, in the case of uh, a national standard from BSI, for example, for, from UK, from UK, would be already uh, approved and used for many years in UK and would be quite major and would be of interest to the international community, maybe BSI would propose it. And if the, it feels that uh, that standard is already quite good, and would not maybe have a lot of uh, comments because there is a good international consensus on the container of that standard, then we could go for the fast track process. This is a decision from the technical committee to go for the fast track process. And so in such a process, uh, the CD stage and could be skipped. So from the NP, the NP is still required because there is still a need to vote whether uh, for the P members, whether they would approve to develop a, such a standard and publish it or not. And then they could go directly to the CDV. And if the CDV is fully approved, then it's possible to go directly to publication in an IS. And so you can see that from seven stages, we can go down to three stages in the case where the, um, uh, the standard is major. Now, I just like also to give you a few information about the deadlines because uh, the Standardization Management Board, the SMB, has set 
time limits in order to ensure that we don't have standard development projects that last five, ten years and so on. And so we have uh, the following time limits. First of all, you, have, you see that the, the clock is starting ticking when the RVN is circulated. So when the RVN is circulated, this is the starting time to count the time limits. And there is a limit of 12 months to circulate the CD. There's a limit of 24 months to circulate the CDV. A limit of 33 months to circulate the FDIS. And a limit of 36 months to publish the standards. Then there's also other time limits uh, which are mainly about the results of vote for all the documents. So for example, when after the closing of the NP ballot, there is four weeks limit to circulate the RVN, which is the result of vote. After the CD, there is also a four week limit to circulate the compilation of comments. After the CDV, there is a 12 weeks limit to circulate the RVC. And after the FDIS, there is a two weeks limit to circulate the RVD. Of course, these limits are important for the transparency of the process because within four weeks, you really have to share all the comments received with, with all the P members and all the experts in the committee. That's the same for the CD and the CDV, where also you need to share the votes. And the FDIS, you also need to share the votes. So this is important uh, for the transparency of the process. OK, so now I'm done with the slides I wanted to pres present and the subjects I wanted to address. I will start to, I will answer the, la the last question that, I've, that has been uh, uh, and now this is the time to have a question and answer uh, session. So if you have other questions, please do not hesitate to use the, uh, the question functions and write uh, your question. Uh, during that time, I will so go back to the question I received and I didn't answer to. The question is, uh, can you explain the difference between an international standard and a technical specification? Basically, in the IEC, we have three main types of publications. We have technical reports, technical specifications, and international standards. An international standard is the document which requires the highest level of consensus, okay, with all that process. If, I mean, the subject to be standardized is either very new and not really mature to go for a real full standard, or if the subject is still very contentious and that there is a low level of consensus on the requirements to be, uh, I mean, uh, documented into a standard, then it is possible to go to a technical specification. So a technical specification is a normative document with a lower level of consensus than an international standard. It needs and requires only a simple majority. It doesn't require a two-third majority and less than 25 opposite votes. A simple majority is good enough. A technical specification has a limited lifetime uh, which is three years for the first revision and six years maximum. After the six years, either there is a project to convert the technical specification into an international standard or the technical specification should be withdrawn. And finally, also, I mentioned uh, a third type of uh, publication, which is the technical report. And Technical reports are documents which do not contain requirements but contain technical information, general technical information about the technology. 
and describing the technology, but they do not contain requirements uh, about safety, about uh, interoperability or whatsoever. Okay, so a technical report is just a technical document. So we have technical report and a technical report also requires a simple majority uh, level to be approved and published. So we have technical report, technical specification and international standards. Okay, I hope I've uh, answered the question. At that point, I do not see any further question raised here, here in the dialog box for the questions. So, as I do not see any further question, uh, I just now then have to thank you uh, very much for your attention. As you can see, you also have the possibility to download the PDF of the slides that have been presented uh, this afternoon, Geneva time, afternoon Geneva time. And so, uh, I just uh, want to thank you very much for uh, your participation and for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Have a nice continuation of your day. Bye-bye.